you definitely shouldn't give fame to people who want to be famous and you probably shouldn't give fame to people who don't want to be famous. Um, I would say that, you know, fame is definitely a thing to be avoided and I've done very well at that. <laughs> My name is John Doran and I write about music. In this series for Noisy, I've been speaking to notable figures from popular music such as Brian Ferry and Gary Newman. As this series continues, I will be speaking to other talents, other outliers, other British masters. Today I'm talking to Luke Haynes, rock star and author. He's a man who's been accused of inventing Britpop when his band The Auteurs released their debut album New Wave in 1993. With this and other projects such as Black Box Recorder, Haynes became balefulness personified in an age of bland and chipper compliance. So, your first book, which, not to blow smoke up your ass, I think is one of the best bits of music writing I've like, read in the last decade. It says the word Britpop on the, yeah. on the title. It isn't really about Britpop, is it? Well, what is it about? I mean, it's pretty much all rock and roll kind of follows you know, one or two stories of group starts with some friends, you know, maybe gets a bit of small amount of success, um, friends get sacked, some professional guys come in, group gets a bit more success. Success either kind of goes up or goes down. Um, in the case of the auteurs, it kind of went down. Um, then the ending is either sort of death, madness or survival. Um, and I think, you know, in, in that book, you know, the ending was sort of like more kind of madness and survival. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of the, the rock and roll story. Bear in mind, it, it, it was how I, it was kind of what I was thinking at the age of 25, 26, 27, rather than the age of 39, 40, whatever it was when I wrote it. So it was the inner monologue um, and the kind of diary that no one should ever see. So you'd presumably feel a lot more warmly to some of the characters in the book in this day and age? Most of them I don't think about. I mean, I thought about those, I thought about all those the people that are mentioned in it at the time, because yeah. they were they were kind of they were kind of there either as an irritation, because i.e. they were making records at the same time as me, or I was you know I, I, I knew them in some way. Not everyone was an irritation. You know, some people in, in it are all right. It was a really strange time anyway. There was a lot of kind of you know com competition in a, but in a really bad way. That NME editor bloke, um, Ian Sutherland, or whatever his name was. Steve who, Sutherland. Steve, yeah, him, that bloke, yeah, who thought all rock and roll was, should be like the Premier League. He kind of um, engineered this idea into, into the main players, I think, of Britpop, and it became about that, and it was just like, Jesus Christ, this is a shit scene. <laughs> I don't think Faith No More should be blamed for new metal. Do you feel any kind of remorse for releasing New Wave? Nah, because I think that the first bands that were kind of... Um, associated with that, we had, had other ideas about it, like, you know, the 90s felt to me like it was just like all these sort of uh, arseholes who felt emasculated by, you know, by Thatcher, you know, just then went and went and sort of like had to show how laddish they all were, you know, um, throughout it all. Maybe the first sort of year of that, 1992 and maybe early 93, you know, the, the, there, wasn't, there wasn't a feeling of that intense competition that kind of then got introduced with certain other people. Um, got on the bandwagon um, and it was it was kind of like it felt like people were doing something sort of that had a kind of similar idea to it I mean you know I, I remember talking to to Pulp about you know and it, it felt like we had a kind of some kind of common ground and even to an extent the early suede um, kind of records. There's obviously two different sto versions of this story about the story about you breaking your ankles oh, yeah, yeah. and I think there's about six different versions most of them by me. Which is your favourite? My favourite? Um, the real version is that um, so I was, was just fed up of touring and I was just very drunk. I mistook what I thought to be a soft <laughs> surface to be a rather hard surface and I misjudged um, my ability to, to leap off a wall that was 15 foot or something like that um, without actually doing some damage. Um, you know, I think it was that I was full of... Um, Bravado. Do you um, see it as a blessing in retrospect? In the, in, in the fact that I'm presuming that it's a given that you would have become a lot more famous than you did because... Oh, I don't think so. No, I think we, no, I think we were on the slide anyway. <laughs> if it did anything, it just made me... Um, it made me stop touring 
to that, to the extent that I was touring, you can actually write more songs and make more albums, which is kind of what it's about for me. Not really, you know, like going around like 50 countries in a fucking van, you know, with a bunch of cuts. <laughs> <laughs> what I was thinking when I first heard about this was maybe more along the lines of a really kind of violent and haphazard career management. I certainly think that someone like Mark Smith mm. is a lot more astute than he lets on in maintaining his band yeah. never go above a certain level, if you see what I mean. Talking of The Fall, I think you've had more hit singles than The Fall, I think. I think The Fall have only had one. I've only had one. I thought you'd had Level two. Peg, only one top 20. Oh, um, top yeah. 20, all right, fair enough. The Fall have never had a top 20, though, I don't think. There you go. <laughs> more hit singles than The Fall. Did you, <laughs> did you expect the Black Box record a song to become a hit? Yeah. That was meant to be a hit. That was, the, that was really, the, there were only two times I've ever tried do a hit. We got, the auteurs got close with Lenny Valentina, but that was actually a B-side. So the record company made, they said, so record it again, because it's really good. And I recorded it again, and they were oh yes, yeah, amazing. And I was kind of like, it's all right. So it shows that, I, that at that point, I never had any idea what a hit single was anyway. But this Black Box Recorder single was a, was a definite attempt at having a hit that John Moore and myself, um, we kind of, we just, we listened to the radio and we studied it and we did the things you're meant to do. And we thought we can slip a bit of kind of Black Box Recorder kind of stuff in, Trojan Horse, if we, you know, if we kind of follow the rules of the radio and we did it. It's just the facts of life. There's no much plan. What we have for school. Hold my hand. I'm probably misrepresenting you both by asking this question, and there's an obvious undercurrent that I'm suggesting you both slightly curmudgeonly or what have you. When uh, you met Steve Albini, did you find him to be a kindred spirit? But definitely, yeah. It was very funny because it was also the Blur and Oasis stuff, and he would just be, he just thought they were kind of like Herman's Hermits and the Monkeys. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't really, he really didn't understand it at all. It was very. You know, it's just quite fun having to explain this to him, how British music and British, the British music press works. And he was just like, nope. I found it actually quite touching, the gift he posted to you. Oh, yeah. He gave me a, a, a hammer, which I still got, and, uh, and a, a copy of the uh, Elton John um, Diana record, Goodbye England's Rose. Yeah. Yeah. Can you um, tell us a little bit about North Sea Scrolls. Well, we actually found it, found the scrolls or the, or the kind of scraps of them in a bin um, outside a supermarket. And uh, we believe that they, they were originally bequeathed to um, a bit part actor called Tony Allen. Um, and we, uh, we, we took these, these scrolls and, and, and following Tony Allen's instructions, we assembled the scraps into um, an academic lecture um, via song. If I got it right, is that you had to drop a Jimmy Savile song? We didn't have to. We chose to drop a song about Sir Jim. The whole thing was written before his death. Um, we didn't particularly want to wade into the Savile yeah. circus. But, um, you know, I can't avoid uh, bringing up Off My Rocker at the Art mm -hmm. School Bop. <laughs> that album has a reference to Savile on it as well. And there's, there's a song about the Glitter Band. Um, and there's the song, The Walt and the Hop. So it's something of the sort of, um, you know, there are three songs about paedophiles on there. Um, so maybe I should re-release it now, um, you know, now that it's all the rage. I remember when I first heard New Wave that, I mean, I, I didn't think of this in a pejorative way, but I definitely thought of you initially as being like kind of quite retro in a way, very obsessed with the mm. past, but I think now that I got that completely wrong, it seems like almost everything you were writing about, things like terrorism, the Taliban, child murder, lots of things that you wrote about are things that we have become nationally obsessed again with now. Yeah. I mean, is, is it your job anymore to still write about things like that? I don't have any, any particular role in any of these, you know, in writing anything at all. You know, I'm just like some, you know, I'm just some guy who strums a guitar. Do you think there should be a rock band or rock bands coming through who do 
sing about these things. I don't think there should be any more rock bands. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's done and dusted. Fuck me, you know. Two guitars, bass and a drum kit. Can you squeeze any more out of that? <laughs> Would you still be um, kind of recording albums at home, as it were, even if you didn't have, like, even a small record label I was willing to put them out? Oh, uh, yeah. Do you, are you... I don't think if you're an artist, you just keep on going. You don't just, like, you just don't stop because there's no fucker going to put your records out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like if you're a painter, you still, you still paint. I don't do this ultimately because there's... Um, you know, a record label putting the records out. It's, it's just what I do, it's who I am. I think out there in the in <laughs> many counties of the United Kingdom, yes. there are young people suffering under the mm. misapprehension that being in a rock band is somehow a good or worthwhile thing mm -hmm. to do. If you had to give some advice to these young chaps in bands, what would it be? <laughs> um, oh, God. Don't do it. <laughs> Luke, Josh. thanks very much. There you go. Thanks very much. Cheers.